All right, we are live. There's no fancy, uh, there's no fancy intro. I'm not sponsored, man. There's no sexy music. This isn't, uh, uh, there's no drink supplement. I'm not selling you a bed. Uh, right. I, I just, I just like talking to cool guys and, and I, I probably should have had you on the show a lot longer. You know, it's just out of sight, out of mind. Um, but uh, welcome Marcus Davis to, to the No Fear podcast, man. How are you? I'm great, man. I'm, I'm really happy to be here, you know? So I'm excited to talk to you. It's, it's been such a long time. And uh, it, you know, it, I, was, I was a groupie in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> and it just got worse <laughs> as I got older. I didn't grow out of it. It's, it's funny. I mean, I forget the year we bumped into each other. You know, I was obviously like, like, uh, I didn't know you'd been following me, like from the martial arts side when I was doing all the panic attack tapes and all the shit from the eighties, but I knew of you from the UFC and, and, and fighting. And then, uh, and then we, uh, bumped into each other at, uh, some club in Vegas. Yeah. Was, yeah. I pretty Trist. 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 That's her yeah. opening or whatever. And, uh, you know, they brought me in as like a kind of like a uh, like a guest or something. Right. And as I'm walking down, you kind of tapped my shoulder and you're like, hey, it's Marcus Davis. And immediately I went, oh, my God, it's Tony Blower. And you were like, <laughs> how do you know who I am? And I'm like, what do you mean? How do I know who you are? And then I started vomiting like all the Black Belt Panther video magazine stuff and all that that I was <laughs> Was it, was, it was amazing. You know, it, it, it's funny. And just to, to reminisce a little on that, you know, I was at the very first UFC in 1993 and uh, I'm in the elevator and some of the guys and, and most of the people in the first UFC, you know, their careers didn't take off. They were just there for the first one. Uh, but there were two or three people who recognized me in the elevator and they were fighters in the, in the card and they knew about me because of the Panther videos, the panic attack tapes. And they said that those videos, that if they hadn't been doing those drills, they would never be doing MMA. That that really, you know, got them doing this force on force stuff that they had never thought to do. It was, it was, it was pretty fascinating because my, my focus as, as you know, and you're, are, you've come full circle from the sport and now back into the pure self-defense, uh, right. you know, training law enforcement real. And it's, um, but, uh, the, the original panic attacks were about finding a way to move past the theory and into pressure testing, uh, uh scenarios, but doing it surgically not just a lot, a lot of people thought they were doing like multiple assailant fighting and, and getting realistic but they're really just sparring really hard they weren't looking at the emotional yeah. psychological physical which was what you know the whole vision i had after my, my student you know lost his fight in 1980 but talk about you know uh pick it up from there like like what were you doing your background and so a lot of people uh, may or may not know, you know, who you are, uh, you, uh, you know, from, but most of my audience are law enforcement, military, uh, hardcore martial artists. So why don't, you, why don't you do a little background on yourself? All right. Uh, yeah, real quick. Uh, you know, I was born in 1973. I started doing uh, martial arts in 1982. I started with uh, traditional like Okinawan karate. And, um, and then I went on to doing uh, uh, Mudokwan Taekwondo. Um, and later on, I did some Tang Sudo Taekwondo. But, and then I started boxing. So I came from a family of boxers. Um, my grandfather on my mother's side was a professional boxer, actually retired undefeated, had over 50 fights. Nice. And just stopped doing it. He became a huge, huge salesman uh, where we lived and made a lot of money um, because he was very respected and, and uh, liked in the area. So, uh, but there weren't any really boxing gyms at that time. So I was your typical kind of street kid story where uh, I grew up in a broken home, um, no father figure. Uh, my mother was trying to raise two boys. Uh, I was in fights all the time, constantly getting in fights. Um, then by the time uh, I was 15, uh, I was uh, homeless. I was on the streets. I was fighting all the time. 
Um, I, as even as a boy, uh, you know, before I was like 18, I'd been stabbed twice. I'd had all kinds of things like, uh, and then as I got older, you know, I had a gun pulled out on me twice, shot at, I believe shot at once. I was running and I heard the gun go off. So I don't know if it's shooting at me or not, but, um, so I've had a lot of different things. And I've been hit with everything you can imagine, like uh, pine glasses. And back in the day when they used to have glass ashtrays, I've had those broken on my head. I've, I've been hit with a four pronged tire arm and I lost my wisdom teeth back there. I've been hit with, I mean, just everything you can imagine. Uh, and then I was uh, fighting so much on the streets that I ended up, uh, you know, being arrested uh, and did a lot of other bad stuff as you do when you're a kid and you're homeless and, and everything. And so uh, I ended up in a youth facility for a little while, kind of like, you know, Mike Tyson's story. So uh, I was there for about six months. And then I got out and I said, you know, I'm never going to get in trouble again. It was enough that uh, I just really appreciated my freedom. And uh, when I was in there, um, you know, it's not that this is a great uh, feat, but obviously I was the brightest kid that was in there and I felt like I didn't belong there. Um, and so when I got out, I, I just made a 180 basically. And the police that were arresting me at that time, there were a couple of them that, you know, started to reach out to me and said, Hey, listen, if you stop biting on the streets, um, we'll, uh, pay for you to box. We'll let you box. We'll take you to matches. So I started boxing for the police athletic league. Nice. Um, then after doing that for years, um, they were constantly telling me, you know what, you need to become a cop. Um, so I went to the police academy in uh, 1993. And while I was there, I ended up signing a professional boxing contract and I was moved to uh, Massachusetts and started living there. So I ended up not going into law enforcement at that time and uh, just started my boxing career. And then when I got down there, um, because I was a, you know, I did everything originally right for combat. I didn't do it because of sport. I, I never envisioned myself uh, being really successful in, in fighting um, and for the fact that I didn't really have the right foundation of anybody who uh, really cared enough to tell me that I was capable of doing that. So you, you, you kind of like, you know, I just kind of got into my head, you know, what? I can, you know, beat people up and get paid. It was kind of like that <laughs> mentality back then. And so right. I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that. And I'll work in nightclubs and bars along the way. So while I lived in Boston, um, I was working in uh, first it was Esme and then it turned into the Mercury bar and that's in the combat zone. Um, right on Boylston Street in Boston. So I was there, and while I was there, I, you know, obviously 1993 is when the first UFC happened, and I saw all that Gracie Jiu Jitsu stuff, and I called bullshit uh, because when I was watching it, and, and you know, again, at that time, uh, it was at least they had headbutts, they had stuff like that, but I just didn't feel like everybody that was in that first UFC was, you know, there weren't a whole lot of guys that you would say were super athletic. They were, I, I, it was obviously, I, even then I was able to see that and go, this is a way to sell this crazy jujitsu stuff. Um, not to, uh, show really who the best fighter on the planet is right now. So, but I wanted to learn more about it because I had, had no idea about the, uh, the, the jujitsu, the, you know, the Brazilian jujitsu part of it. Sure. I had done small circle jujitsu stuff like that and Wally J kind of stuff, but, no uh, real ground fighting. I did judo too at the police station when I was there. So they had a judo. dude. Let, let me let me let me interject there because I was um, <clears throat> cage side, you know, writing for three magazines that and that turned into a really controversial article because <clears throat> my whole thing was you know 1993. I had already developed the spear system. Already was just launching high gear. I had the panic attack tapes out and <clears throat> I was there with um, a good friend of mine, Mark, uh, this, uh, hang on a sec. I got something in my throat. <clears> throat> Excuse me. Wow. Um, Walt Lysak out of, uh, out of Massachusetts, you know, really uh, street savvy, uh, lots of street fighting experience. And I didn't know this at the time, but his whole family had been doing, you know, a street version of jujitsu for years we've been friends. He'd bring me in for seminars, but I was like you, 
I watch guys like tap out and do little things. And, and like, I went back to the room after and I said, come on, man, a guy grabs your ankle like that. You can't sit up and punch him in the face. And, you know, someone grabs you from here. You can't just drill him here. And he says, well, if the guy gets it on, man, like it really, you know, you can break an ankle pretty quickly. You can, you can really do some damage. And I remember sitting there, Marcus on the floor in the hotel after the fight. And I went, I don't, I don't believe it. And he sat down and he grabs my ankle and uh, starts an ankle lock and he just cinches it a little bit. Yeah. And I go, well, like if you were doing this, we we're fighting my hands are free. I just lean forward. And I lean forward to grab him to fucking drop a shot. And he goes like this. He goes like this. And I felt my, and Walt's very fucking strong. I felt my my shin bone bend in the wrong direction. <laughs> I, I, I didn't have any pain, but my body at a physiological level arched right. backwards. Right. And I was like, what the fuck? And, and but I didn't have any pain yet. So I, I went to continue my movement. And he said, like, if I moved a little bit more like this, and then all of a sudden my body just locked. And I was like, holy fuck. I was like, right. I, was, I was amazed. But anyways, I, I had to insert that because when you said you watched it and you're going on calling bullshit, you know, I looked at it and I said, why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing that? Yeah. You know, but go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. It's what You're right. You're right on. And it's what people who don't know anything about it still to this day, they watch the UFC and they go, well, that guy's trying to tackle him. Why aren't you just uppercutting him? That's what right. I do. You know, that all the, you know, you say that, and you know, and when I hear that sometimes in my head, I go, what an idiot. And then I go, well, wait a minute. That's what I we did. did. <laughs> yeah. right? I thought the same thing at one point. So um, I ended up, uh, so I pulled out the, the uh, phone book and I went through the yellow pages and just started looking, trying to find the name uh, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, anybody that taught it. And looking for the name Gracie, and I ended up uh, calling one of them was uh, where uh, Kenny Florian was training, and it was. And I called and I said, "Yeah, I want to do a private." And the guy was like, "Yeah, it's 120 an hour." So this is back in 1993. So right. I'm like, "I'm going to you're you're high." And I hung right. and I ended up going through, and I found this one that said uh, Jeet Kune Do, uh, and then at the bottom it said, "You know, uh, student of Paul Vunak." And then it said uh, Hickson Gracie Jiu Jitsu. So I didn't know who Hickson was. I had no idea. Um, but it said it was a Gracie name. So I went there and I walked in and uh, paid for, you know, well, actually I actually called first, set up a private. I went in and it was Joe Moffey came in and Joe Moffey uh, walks up to me. And if you know Joe, Joe's kind of like the short, kind of chubby guy. Yeah. So I look at him. And I'm like, oh no, I just got ripped off 60 bucks. I'm like, I'm about to just, you know, this. And he looks at me and he, and he has that funny little voice and it's creepy eyes. Cause he has no, he has like, uh, um, uh, no color in his eyes. So right. they're, just, they're just like creepy. They're a little blue, but, uh, they're albino like eyes. So I see him and he's like, uh, you know, uh, Hey, uh, you know, what's your experience? And I go, none. And he goes, None, you don't have any experience? And I'm like, no, I don't got any experience. And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> he goes, so what is it that you want to learn? And I'm like, yeah, I want to learn this uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu stuff. I just want to see what it's all about. You know, I watch the UFC and I'm just curious and everything. And he, and so we get on the ground and he's like, go ahead. Let's just, you know, grapple around and wrestle a little bit. I had never done anything, you know, like that. You know, I wrestle with my friends and put each other in headlocks and noogies and stuff right. like that. <laughs> not, not at that point, right. Not at that point. I had not like, <clears throat> got, you know, and anything that I had done that was, uh, was more like lock flow stuff, you know, like uh, uh, wrist locks and all that shit that doesn't work. And I'd already realized by then that it was all bullshit because right. when I went to the police academy and everybody was doing that, I was like telling everybody, you know, which they didn't want to hear from a 19 year old kid that I would beat their ass. If there was no way that they would be able to contain right. me with a wrist lock. So at that point, I'm like, that's all, it's all horseshit. Um, so, uh he just proceeds to uh basically man rape me i mean <laughs> he just throws me i mean and twists me up and he's tapping me out and he's submitting me left and right and i'm just blown away i'm like oh my god this is this is actually some real stuff so um 
you know, and after we were done, he said, so why did you want to do this? You know, why is this your thing? And I said, because, you know, uh, you know, I grew up uh, street fighting a lot and everything. And, you know, I want to be able to defend myself. I work at a bar, a nightclub. And he's like, oh, is that why? And I said, yeah. And he goes, take this. And he gave me a VHS tape because there was no DVDs at that time. But he gave me a VHS tape to take home. And uh, it was a video of him basically fighting in like bars and on the street and doing all this. And all of it was like mock, you know, stuff. But it was like his way to sell kind of his program. Right. And Involved a lot of, you know, obviously uh, more of the, uh, I would say the Danny and Sonato part of the, like maybe the Panatukin and the, uh, you know, Sealot stuff, that kind of fighting, Dumag, you know, that kind of stuff, um, which still involves, you know, kind of like that, the little bit of the clenching there with the head butts and the elbows and all that stuff. So I was sold on it. I was like, yeah, this is, I want to do this. So, uh, Real quick, then after what ended up happening, as he, he was like, I got to take off uh, when I was at the gym. He was like, I got to take off. Um, you you can stay. The guys are going to spar if you want to stay and watch. I said, okay. So the gym started to fill up. And uh, they one of the guys that came in said, uh, hey, uh, you, uh, do you know how to you know do box or kickbox or whatever? And, and you want to spar? And I was like, sure. So I ended up putting um, the gloves on and got in there. And I just ended up torture and everybody right? right so i was just at that time uh i think i was probably like maybe eight and oh as a pro boxer with like six knockouts and you know and i'd already had like uh you know, I don't know 50 50 fights amateur and whatever so i you know and i had a lot of experience and they were just like holy crap so then i get a phone call at my house and it's joe mafia and he's like you know, hey, uh, those guys tell me you stuck around and you sparred and you, you know, beat all their asses. And I was <laughs> like, I was like, uh, yeah, I guess. And he's like, well, uh, I thought you said you didn't do anything. <laughs> and I said, well, you know. And then I told him, I said, I signed a contract, and the contract that I have says I can't even play basketball or any sports without a written permission to do so. Um, and so by me going there, I'd be in violation of my contract and I'd get in a lot of trouble. So anyways, that was kind of like my introduction, you know, into the jujitsu part. So, but the thing is, is like, I never, so I, I see that there, there, I, I think you and I are in the same area with this. Like, it's something you have to know, but it's, it's not the magic of salt. It doesn't solve everything. So right. there's so many other, you know, like fight modifiers and things that happen in a fight that change that, that people don't understand. Once you, uh, once you uh, uh, take away um, the rules and then you're able to, you know, use your environment, you're able to use uh, uh, a lot of like untangible things people don't realize uh, that you don't do when you're in the safety of a gym. Like it's stuff that you can't really train. Right. Uh, yes, you could, but you're going to be the person afterwards. And, uh, you know, you won't, you know, you it, might need help getting your socks on the next day, but you're, right. you, you could it, be. It's, it's hard. And let me, let me unpack that a little bit and elaborate yeah. for our listeners a little. Because uh, uh, I know where you're going and you're also, you're, you're, you're being polite and mindful and respectful. Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who say what you say but they don't have scar tissue that you have. They don't have the memories of, you know, the ashtray and the knife and the crowbars and the, and so I want everyone listening to this, like when Marcus is talking about, he's talking about a guy who grew up in the streets, who fought, who had people try to smash his skull in and, but he also, you know, uh, box and people don't, let me talk about boxing for a second. Back, back in the day, you know, as a good athlete, skilled martial artist, uh, but I was well known in Montreal, Marcus, and so I couldn't go anywhere and spar and not have somebody try and take my head off. Wow. And I and I wasn't and I wasn't um, like nowhere near like your uh, caliber or any pro. But I was like I was good with my hands and I moved and I practiced and you know you watch my tapes. I'm a, I'm a good yeah. combat athlete. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so 
I was I was training at the Hilton's gym. And you remember the Hilton's, uh, Davey and Matthew and Alex yeah. and all these guys. Yeah. And, you know, they yeah. fought for a world champ. They were, I mean, they were world-class fighters, but they're always in trouble with the law. And that uh, invariably uh, destroyed them. But one year, early, early on, I went to Gleason's gym in New York. Mm -hmm. and, and I sparred a guy who was ranked number six in the world. And I mean, like, I... I I always make this joke that that he hit me so fast and so hard that there's like several seconds of my life that are still floating around in Gleason's gym, you know, uh, that I don't even remember, you know, yeah. I, I, I hit him. And as I was, as I, my jab came back, my hand dipped down because I was so used to sparring students that I would make all sorts of mistakes and do, you know, stupid yeah. Sugar Ray Leonard stuff like that because they were my students. Right. And I fire the shot and my hands dropping. And all of a sudden I just see like his right peck move. And I realized, fuck. And then this <laughs> just boom, I came to like at a clinch on the ropes, flash knockout, uh, longest, right. longest, you know, two or three rounds of my life. But I say that only to put in perspective what, when you said you had eight pro fights and six knockouts and 50 fights, guys listening to this, they you have no idea how hard a pro boxer hits and if you're a martial artist and you've never been hit by a boxer you right. owe it to yourself as ed like <laughs> just to, just to do that because it's insane and they did they did studies back in the day and these were unpopular studies but how boxers hit harder than martial artists hit harder like yeah. and, and people didn't want to believe that oh, i could break boards i could do that and and you just need to understand this context and where, where Marcus is going. So I just wanted to, to frame that in, in many ways, more than almost anybody, him saying, uh, and, he, and he fought UFC and he studied jiu-jitsu and he, and he did the Jeet Kune Do and, and the traditional stuff, saying, be careful. And this is like what I, you know, uh, I've got all these maxims, as you know, because my main business is training trainers. And I tell people, be careful what you practice. You might get really good at the wrong thing. Yeah. And, and a lot of people took that as me insulting their art or their system. What I was always talking about was the neuroscience of training. That And this is, I think, what you were alluding to. And I'm just putting Sorry, it into... I'm having trouble I'm, hearing you. I'm just putting that. I don't know why fucking Siri does that. <laughs> um, so annoying. Um, the, uh, so I'm just going to put it into, into neuroscience terms for people listening and I know you dig this stuff anyhow, but every yeah. time you do a rep, your neuron fires. And every time your neuron fires, it wires. And it's a neural pathway. It's not muscle memory. There's no literal muscle memory. And, and this, this, the process of improving the signal speed, your reaction time, the, 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 the speed between stimulus response, is part of that is called the myelination of the neuron. And it's the, the, the thickness of the myelin sheath, and it helps with the speed of transferring this information. So the danger is, is when you put all your, your metaphoric eggs in one basket, that's what you're talking about. Is like, yeah. hey, you're really good at grappling. And so suddenly you, you, you see yourself in a fight, you're shooting, you take the guy down, but you didn't pause to notice that this was outside of a bar and he had three friends with him. And now you're on the ground and people are kicking you in the head. And, and um, I had this at a, um, a military unit that I was teaching. And there was a guy there who was like world-class jujitsu. And we had this scenario that I had guys doing. We had long gun, we had, you know, high gears, everyone's in high gear suits, long guns, pistols. And it was muzzle strike the bad guy. The bad guy gets hit with the high gear suit, falls back. You go in to grab him to facilitate your control, take him down, flex tie him. And at that moment there, he's supposed to attack you. You hit the spear. So you deploy the spear, get outside 90. And at that moment, because your long gun is stuck inside and you can visualize this because you shoot and you then you play with all this stuff. So the, the, the movement here. It's right here. Yeah, hold on a sec. Where's my fucking... 
So my my movement here is is to come in beautiful. This is a plastic. <laughs> I just so, said right. This is this is the plastic. <laughs> I know. I know that. Um, <laughs> But so it was to come in, muzzle strike the bad guy, he falls back, and then you sling your weapon to grab the guy, right? And pull him on the ground. And at that moment, and at that moment, um, what we're supposed to do is from here, where you bring the guy to the ground, he goes to tackle, you hit the half spear, then transition to your pistol, cover opposing threats, and then, and then, Take the guy, take it. And it was set up as a ballistic micro fight that you remember from the panic attack. And it was right. evolved and it's very dynamic and it's real time roll speed. And there was this one guy that anytime the role player went to shoot under, he always went into a guillotine. Yeah. Right. And he'd go for yeah. the he'd go for the guillotine or guillotine, depending on where in the world you, yeah. you are, tomato, tomato, right? And he would do the the the, the guillotine and then he'd he'd come up and then he'd release it and then go into the spear. But you're always inserted. So I went over to him and I said, dude, just do the spear. It's faster. It's safer. Finger splayed outside 90. Comes right off your gun. Hit the spear. Keep the guy away. There's your workspace. You can get in there. You can, you can access your, your tools there. And he goes, okay, got it. We do the next rep. He's up again. He does, he does a guillotine again. And it was very smooth. And he's world class, right? So for people watching this, the guy would come in instead of just hitting the guy here with the spear, smashing the guy, transitioning the pistol, being able to shoot. He would hit, roll the guy here, do the quick guillotine, then he'd roll out. He would still do the move, but he couldn't not insert the guillotine. Yeah. And so I say to I say to my uh, my uh, my assistant instructor at the time, I said, "Go talk to him. I'm getting irritated. Like he's fucking still doing. I know I know he's good at jujitsu. He doesn't. I think he's doing it just to show people." You could slip right. it in. You know, martial artists are right. Yeah. Couldn't I do this? Okay. Couldn't I do this? You can do whatever the fuck you want, but this is right. our seminar now. Fucking do this. So I see them talking. He says, okay. And uh, he does it again. And this is like real speed. It's not slow. Right. right. Yeah, so yeah. I'm like, so I'm like going, what the fuck is with this? And then I remembered, I don't know if you've read this book yet. And I recommend it to anybody who teaches the talent code, the talent code. Um, is an amazing book and you'll you'll love it because you're a coach and it explains in layperson's terms the neuroscience and it actually will shed light into my ballistic microfights and all the stuff there because i was reading it and i was like holy shit i didn't know what i was doing i was following my intuition but what i realized this and everybody who loves jeet kune do taekwondo jiu-jitsu krav whatever you you're listening to this you all have a bias Everyone has a bias, right? And that unconscious bias is what could get us killed. It's our blind spot. Yeah. It's our blind spot for personal safety. And it would be like if, if, if you said, you know, I only need one gun, right? And I'm not going to ask you how many guns you have and how many <laughs> knives, you have, right? But because uh, you don't even know probably, but <laughs> what the number is, right? But, but the idea is like, if you only had one and that wasn't the weapon you needed to save your life, you got a problem. And that's the concept. Let me finish the story here. And then I want you to kind of like, like uh, take the mic from there and, and elaborate on, on your experience with that. Because I, I thought for a moment that this guy was doing what I'd experienced many times in, in the hundreds of seminars I've done. There's always one guy there who's trying to consciously, unconsciously show everybody like how his art or system also works. Yeah. And I was like, fuck, man. You know what's with this guy and then i remembered i was i was just processing the stuff from the talent code and you know the whole ten thousand hours ten thousand reps metaphor tipping point all that stuff yeah, yeah, yeah so this guy had done a week of spear versus 20 years of jujitsu in yeah. his life and i was so i'm there if there was a moment and it was a big epiphany for me as a coach as a trainer, because I realized that sometimes when you're coaching some kid or new guy who can't get your move, sometimes you're going, why is this guy so thick headed? Why is he so stubborn? But it's not that Marcus and everyone listening. The neural patterns, what we think is muscle memory, which doesn't exist, are non-conscious uh, uh, communication in the brain, neuromuscular communication. He had seen for 20 years that when somebody goes and, and lowers, changes elevation, that if he can't sprawl, that he's going to hook the head and do a guillotine. Right. So he was, his default non-conscious reaction was guillotine. He didn't even know he was doing it. 
Yeah. And, and that was a big light bulb moment for me. And, and, and then figuring out a way to explain it because these guys, this, this, this was like an operational training unit, you know, they needed to understand like inserting that one move in there could compromise their safety or the mission. Right. You, you got to You got to keep it smooth. But I wanted to elaborate on that because, you know, um, you were not tiptoeing around, but saying, hey, like a lot of people, you, you, it's when I got into the grappling after Walt tapped me out and scared the shit of me with that stuff. All I did for every single day was try to figure out and learn this grappling. And I was actually down at Na Naval Special Warfare down near where I moved. Uh, uh, selling the Navy our prototypes on the high gear and um and in one of the demos, the guy asked me about gun disarms and I did a gun disarm on him. And as I did this, this super cool move, he dropped down and went to nail me in the fucking nuts. I mean, this thing went live yeah. and I was like, you know, and he went down, he dropped down as, as I twisted his hand, he dropped down and went for my nuts. And as his hand came down, dude, I spun him like this. So he flew to his back and I stepped over him and I put him in an arm bar. <laughs> and as I pulled him in the arm bar, you know, the guns over here, I pull him in, in the arm bar and I, as I bring his hand up like this, his hand, and I bite his thumb and his hand opens and I yep. grab the gun with my left hand, scoop over his arm, continue the arm bar with my right. And I put the gun in his head. So, nice. And it happened so fast. I never practiced it. It was just there. And I was right. like, I was like, and there were five other, of these seal trainers there and they're all like what the fuck because it happened so fast right and um they ended up hiring me they bought a bunch of gear they ended up hiring me to teach but the next day i came back and not a lot of people know this story you've never heard this and um uh i apologized for what happened and this i think this story which i just remembered because of what you were saying illuminates what, what, what I believe you were getting at. And that is I had been grappling so much that my counter when this, when I rolled the guy was to continue with grappling and I wasn't taking into account the scenario. I came back the next morning and they were like, wow, that was pretty amazing. And I said, I got to apologize for what happened yesterday. They go, what are you talking about? That was fucking how you, you, you bit it closer to weapon, closer to target, hand came out, gun on the guy. I go, but if this was really the scenario, if this was really the scenario, I was on the floor when there were five of his friends standing over me and I had my, 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 like my gun in the guy's head. You still there? You good? Marcus, did I lose you? Yeah, something happened. No, I'm sorry. I got your okay. back. No, no, no. Okay, no, no, okay. Mute. Yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, but, you know what I what I did is I apologized, and yeah. why I apologize is is because I always when I'm teaching personal safety, whether it's for an organization or an individual, we always talk about the attack, but we more importantly talk about the scenario. Right. And and in this case here, I said there are so many other things I could have done to disarm the guy without putting myself on a back, without putting it into my, my, my other hand. And I took my eyes off the five of you. There was no context there. And I said, the reason I did that is because, uh, you know, uh, for the last six months, this was in 1993, for the last six months, I have grappled every single day. And what happened was all of my neural patterns was the second I grabbed somebody was I wanted to squeeze them. I wanted to right. fucking lock them up. I wanted to make them tap. And as you know, because because you got very good at this stuff, like like there was something very satisfying with making another man tap out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right? Break the will. Breaking a man's will is something, you know that, uh, you know, uh, most men, right? If that you know men who fight uh, aren't willing to do it, right? There's men, uh, you know, like when I fought Nate Diaz, I wasn't going to tap. I went unconscious. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's sometimes there's guys that are willing to, you know, yeah, that, right. Uh, as they say, go out on their shield. So, right. No, anyways, uh, so I, I, you made me think of that story, which, which I, I don't tell very often, but it was that idea of 
and you know, let's go back like 50 minutes after you, 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 you started studying the jiu-jitsu, but to remind everybody who's, who's training for personal safety because you're a cop, because you're military, because you're a doorman, because you're, is to understand the totality of the, the potential risk and, and that when you practice something too much, those neurons get trained to just look for that. And I, and I always tell people this, that, that if you've got a non-conscious bias yeah. to do something, that actually changes true situational awareness. Because you're, yeah. really, you're not really looking at the totality of every, you're looking for ways to insert what you are good at or to make that happen. Yeah, that cognitive bias, you know, turns into uh, cognitive dissonance at some point. And then your thalamus will like block any information trying to prove that that's wrong because all it wants to do is prove that you're right. Right. So that's what happens is then, then that's why you're going to continue that circle of jujitsu over just uh, right uh, over the thought of um, right. You, like you've said, you've trained your brain. This is what you're doing. So now it's become a habit. Um, right. And, and uh, you're not really thinking about anything other than, that move because your brain is just that's where it's focused so i always say to my students i'll say don't marry a technique mm. right so don't uh and that's what you know like again if we go back to bruce lee when you're talking about like uh when in that uh enter the dragon it, when he's pointing up to a student he says uh and a student looks up and he slaps the student in the head and he goes do not look at the finger or you will miss all the gl glory in between right right so he gets that tunnel vision and you focus on one thing and i think fighters do that fighters you know when they're fighting they'll say uh i have to land this strike so they're trying to force that technique right to fire off and then it doesn't materialize and now they're behind right so it's like if you're you know action and reaction if i'm thinking to myself uh, i'm gonna wait for him to jab and when he jabs i'm gonna counter it with said technique the problem with that is now he kicks and i get hit and then he does you know he draw level drops he, and i'm waiting for the jab and by the time the jab comes i get hit with it because i've been distracted with all the other stuff right so you can't you, you you can't do that and that's that whole the the, the thought process behind like why the spear itself right is it's it's unbiased it is what it is it it, it you're not uh you, you're uh so like when we we're talking about my my uh, masashi and the void i believe that is what he's talking about his his talk is like don't look for any said technique see everything be aware of situational awareness see it all right so being in that what you know the ooda loop being in that constant ooda loop and being part of everything that's happening you're not only uh observing you know how the how your opponent's standing right uh right uh, those uh uh, uh pre-contact indicator pre-contact cues yeah yeah where you know he may be you know right-handed or left-handed uh is he tall is he short um you know, uh, is, do I see a weapon on him? You see all these different things that you see visually. Um, and then you're orientating, you're saying, you know, uh, okay, are we in a parking lot? Is there a car right there? You know what, you're gonna use your environment or it's gonna be used against you. And then you're going through all that and you're, and you're, and this sounds like a long process, but it isn't when you train this, right? Then, you, then you're making immediate decisions and then you act upon those decisions 100%. There's no, like, if you talk to a wrestler, a wrestler doesn't go, I'm going to try to do a double leg takedown. Right. They hit, they drive, they drive, they drive, they drive. And when they don't get it, they end up with a single or they end up doing something else. Right. So it's, it's, it's just being on it. So then what happens is like, let's so the, you get into the engagement. So the first is the opening. So the opening happens, which is, let's say it is the spear. And uh, because like you always point out that if, we're the good guy and they're the bad guy you know the first thing in strategy is initiative so you're, you're giving up initiative uh you know to a to a point and then there's action and inaction right inaction with the hyphen um right. <laughs> and so making sure that you're uh 
that you're, you know, you're aware and like the, and people got to think about this, right? I always think of the spear now. I think of it like the toad that eats the fly, right? So the toad that eats the fly, he doesn't, uh, right? So the, the, he doesn't see, he doesn't see the fly and threat discriminate. It's an automatic reaction. So it's like if you dangle something, if you dangle string around and it looks like a fly, his tongue's going to come out and hit it. Right. It's just going to happen. And it's because it's a primal survival thing that he doesn't think about it. It just says, your brain goes now and grabs it and does the, you know, gets it for the food. That's kind of what you're looking at here. So it only takes the brain, they, you know, how they gauge this is, is beyond me, but one tenth of a second to send those messages, right? And that's faster than I can push. I've tried it, but pushing a stopwatch with my thumb. So that happens really, really fast. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the, the ability to do that. Um, and when you're talking about these guys that are trying to get the jump on you, right? Somebody's going to sucker punch you or whatever. You're going to see it. There's going to be those pre-contact cues. You're going to also typically, right? It's very rare that somebody throws a straight one down the line. Um, and even if uh, their way of throwing out of the way they're setting up, they still have to cover, you know, the distance. They have to be mobile. Um, they have to they have to be able to penetrate the defenses, right? Because unless you're standing like this or, you know, hands on your hips or whatever, but if you're, if you're having engagement, you're talking and you're like, Hey man, relax, calm down. Right. These are to me, focus pads, right. If I'm padding somebody, I mean, I, you know, uh, so it, there's a lot that they got to get through. So it's not as uh, like everybody thinks that uh, do the, do those laws apply? Yeah, they do apply. But uh, if you're trained, right. And the, you're the guy that you're, you're fighting is is not like you know uh, a elite athlete which is not you're not going to have right an elite athlete that's also real smart uh is going to be using deception and everything to try to set you up um you know even in a uh, in those kind of when we're talking about that there's some sort of uh engagement um before you're attacked um you've got lots of uh time uh, they, people don't see it that way, but I see it that I've got lots of like time to be able to get myself, um, into process, uh, right. to be able to do what, what I have to do. And, 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 you know, doing that for a long time, you, I, I don't want to say you become, uh, super comfortable, but, uh, you know, there's a difference between, you know, people would say to me, you know, uh, are you ever, you know, scared before you fight? You know, uh, when I was fighting in the UFC or boxing or anything. And early on, I would say that it would be definitely fear. And then what started to happen is as I got o over that, the fear changed from, you know, I wasn't worried about getting hurt. Um, it became more of worrying about getting a loss on your record and not making the money. And that fear came from different reasons and stuff. But there was still something there that, was uh you know the motivation was through the expectation of of you know making more money and providing for my family and all that so those kind of things also play a role a, 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 a lot of let me let me riff a little bit on a couple of things you said there you know fear is fear and fear doesn't discriminate you know when you when when you first start fighting it doesn't occur to you that maybe you're going to get fight of the night and a bonus you're right. you're 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 going holy fuck what am i doing <laughs> you know like and you know and to, if you're like a normal person at a cellular level you know there's a part of you that that goes like i don't really want to get hurt i don't want to die i want to survive uh and so we stress inoculate as we continue to do things and which which you did and other pros do i remember on on uh, as a guest on um, one of the Ultimate Fighter shows where Kieran Fitzgibbons from Combat Sports Academy, a good friend of mine, brings me in. And there's 12 guys there. They're all like world-class grapplers, fighters. 
So they weren't new to fighting. Every one of them had cauliflower ears, every one of them scar tissue, every one of them had been in a hundred fights. And Kirian asked me to talk about fear. And I said, okay, how many of you are afraid before a fight? And uh, they all like kind of looked at each other and two guys put their hand up halfway. I said, the rest of you aren't afraid. And they're like, no. I said, you're not afraid of getting cut by Dana. You're not afraid of getting cut by the UFC. You're not afraid of, of losing a fight. And then your wife saying, hey, you're going to have to get another job. You can't continue this. You can't pay. For and then suddenly they all like, what people don't realize, and everyone, everyone listening to this to, to think about this for a second, fear, there's a physiological response to fear. That's the instincts and intuition that you're moving your danger. And then there's a psychological relationship to fear. And, and that is like in the example you gave earlier where you go, okay, I got this guy's number. When he throws a jab, I'm going to hit him with this shot I've been practicing. And then he kicks you and then you're like, fuck. And then that, that kick slows your footwork down a little bit and he hits you with something else. And then he hits you with the jab again because now you're distracted. Oh, I'm two, I'm two points behind and my fucking, what, you know, my coach sucks because that's not the right strategy. And right. all of that changed because your, your actual, you didn't have enough self-awareness to understand that, that, the the unconscious bias that is our self-awareness influences our like i said earlier our, our true situational awareness where go back to musashi just see everything and that's the beauty of the sphere is the start of flinch like your like your toad metaphor the start of flinch doesn't discriminate it doesn't give a fuck if it's a head but a left hook a right hook a knife coming out it goes and i i wrote this the other day this week in in one of my newsletters that, that the startle flinch deploys like an organic airbag in a car accident. And, and, it, and it does that when your cognitive situational awareness has been compromised. If, you're, if your body's survival system goes, oh, fuck, Marcus didn't see this, Tony didn't see this, then we're going to flinch. If we do see it, we're going to preempt, we're going to intercept. And you started right. to see some stuff, and I, I was biting my tongue because I wanted to jump in. You're talking about process. And what, what I want a lot of the people listening, you know, uh, uh, and, and you'll hear certain language and buzzwords that Marcus uses that will sound very familiar because, you know, he's been stalking me for years as, the, as we made the joke <laughs> in, the, in the beginning. But the, the most people learn, they practice their fighting at the, you guys, you remember D1, D2, D3, detect and avoid, defuse and deescalate, and a push comes to shove, defend. Most of the martial arts self-defense world still practices just D3, how to get out of a headlock, how to intercept a punch, how to block this, how to do that. So what happens is, and I call this the timeline of violence and the mental blueprint. It's like, so we teach people, and you do the same thing, to look at violence almost like an architect where we're laying out a blueprint and we're going, this is where you get punched, but this is the street you were walking on. And this is where your situational awareness was fucked because you were on your phone here, motherfucker, looking down yeah. and you didn't see these guys walk across the street. And then that happened here. And if you can see how things are set up, and this is what you were, you were uh, uh, trying to articulate with, you know, nonviolent posture and all of that. If, if you only see, if, if you're studying violence with, Okay, let's do gun disarms. Okay, everyone, gun in the face. What you've done is you've practiced letting somebody stick a gun in your face. You that haven't hurts, yeah. trained any of the pre-contact cues of what, and we call it, so the, the conventional model in the real world is stimulus response training. That is that is not brain-based, that is not Socratic, it is not scenario-based. The way we do stuff is we go, stimulus response is, oh, that's the gun disarm part. But we do stimulus, 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 stimulus response. What happened before? What happened before? What happened before? What happened before? I had to do a gun disarm. If I, if I start thinking about that, I change my situational awareness. I also reveal all the capability gaps in my training because I'm sitting there going, well, fuck, like, what would I do here if I saw the guy do that? Well, I don't know. Let's figure that out. Let's train that. Because that changes process. And that becomes uh, what my friend, uh, Mike Gervais, who's uh, one of the world's top sports psychologists, uh, shared with me that what sports psychologists are calling now mind speed. And I would always talk about, in terms of speed, we've got quickness and we've got suddenness. Quickness is 
you know, if I say to you, Marcus, throw a jab and you go jab and you go, wow, that was pretty quick. But quickness is only relevant if you can do it suddenly against a real stimulus in terms of what we're talking about. So when I'm, when I'm coaching people, I go, I don't care how quick you are. I care how sudden you are. Suddenness is the, the reaction time between stimulus response. And it's a whole, but you, you know, you, you said something earlier with the, um, with Musashi and you said something in a post recently that I want you to elaborate on. And, and it was this idea of not even knowing what you're going to do and how, how can the bad guy counter counter you if you don't even know what you're going to do? Yeah. And I always tell people the bad guy controls the fight. He controls the location. He controls the level of violence and he controls the duration. Your job is to figure out how to beat him. And if you, if you relax into that, that becomes our closest weapon, closest target principle. That becomes our, you just relax into that and the strategy will unfold. I never know, you said this and it kind of blew my mind when you wrote it, because I'd never heard anyone articulate it. When I'm doing a, like a demo or doing a scenario with somebody, I, I never know what I'm going to do because if it's, protective meaning you move first i'm going to let just let the airbag deploy the organic airbag the spear system if i'm trying to preempt and your scenario our scenario is you got a motorcycle helmet on because you just got off a motorcycle i'm not going to do a headbutt right you told me don't do a headbutt because you're wearing a helmet and so i try to explain to the students is that if the guy walks up to me and points his finger in my face and goes here's what's going to happen to you i'm going to break his finger I'm not going to hit him with an overhand. Like, in other words, the bad guy, I, and I, I tell my students this, I go, pretend the bad guy is just covered in lips. He's just got fucking lips all over him. And every target is a lip and it's whispering, hit me, hit me, fucking strike me, strike me. And then what you need to do is you need to be thinking, what is the closest viable weapon you have to the closest actual target presented and start there. Yeah. Anyways, go ahead, rant. Yeah, no, uh, one, yeah, one hundred percent. You know the uh, like we're talking about. Uh, you know, I think that the when you people get that we were talking about cognitive bias to to their style or their technique or whatever it is that they do. Um, there's also a problem where uh, you know when we train in certain ways. So. Uh, so let, let's take jujitsu again. And I hate to keep, keep bringing up jujitsu because it makes me sound like I'm trying to do jujitsu. But let me just say this. In 2017, where I, I, when I retired from mixed martial arts, uh, I retired with more wins by submission than anything else. And in 2017, I competed in the Toro Cup and uh, a super fight with uh, Brian Edwards. Brian Edwards is a six foot uh, four, 240 pound, two time, uh, Nogi, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu champion, is over 200 gold medals, and Jesus. he beat Saulo Ribeiro in uh, Saulo Ribeiro in competition once. And I submitted him in eight minutes of the first round. And nice. nobody, when I showed up and I did, and I came to that, and I brought a bunch and of put, put some perspective in that. How tall are you, and what do you what do you weigh at that? I'm five nine and a half. Um, <laughs> Right. And uh, I'm, I'm a little smaller than I was then. I'm about 195 pounds. I think I was right. like maybe 200. Right. So, uh, you know, Still a huge, lot. huge difference. Yeah, huge big, difference. big difference. And hey, Marcus, hold that story one sec. Sure. Stand by one second, buddy. Okay, so, so uh, continue with the, 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 uh, this, this uh, fight story. This guy's huge. He's a, mon he's a monster compared to you. Right. And so, um, when I bring, I go in, the only guys that come to support me are the cops that I'm training at the time. And, right. uh, you know, they tell me afterwards, after I submitted them, uh, they say, uh, yeah, everybody was, when we came in, they were like, said, when they called me up to the mat, people were going, who the hell is this guy? And uh, they oh. were all going, that's the Irish hand grenade. And they're like, who? And they go, oh, it's UFC uh, vet. And they were like, you know who he's going against that's brian edwards and you know he's you know won world titles he's done this he's done that and they were like well no i didn't know him. i didn't know that 
because right. I don't, I don't follow jujitsu. I didn't know that. And I'm glad I didn't like know that before I went in because I might have, you know, approached it a little more cautiously, but I didn't. I went right after it. And this is, so this is, this is, I don't mean to interrupt that, but it, that is such an important psychological point. Because if you, if you, if you, if you don't have the self awareness to recognize that shift, had yeah. you, had you looked at his resume, you might yeah. have lost that fight. It could have distracted you from the drive. It's going right. Yeah. I, right. Anytime that you're cautious, uh, you're losing opportunity. Um, and, you know, right. Uh, in a, in a fight. So, uh, you know, anyways, when it was over, uh, you know, we all, uh, you know, laughed it off and they, you know, told me about, uh, you know, what was said and everything. And then uh, me and the other guy, the guy that I beat, uh, he actually contacted me on Facebook. And then that's when I learned a lot more about, you know, his, how much he had done. Sure. It's like, Oh shit, man, this guy's done like a lot of had, stuff. Uh, had, just not that it matters, but it does. How, what'd you submit him with? Uh, inverted heel hook. Wow. So he was trying to play, uh, you know, Z guard, like an open Z guard for me. And so then I ended up with the inverted heel hook from there. Crazy. So, uh, but, uh, but my point about all that is, and then, you know, the, my, uh, everybody was talking to me like, well, man, you're such a good grappler, such a good grappler and all this stuff. Like you're, you know, better than you probably are a striker now. And my point to them was, listen, just believe me when I say this, everything I know about grappling, like if this, if I'm fighting for my life, I'm using all those tools to not be on the ground. Mm. I'm using all those. If I don't know, if I don't know how to, how to do a takedown, how do you defend a takedown? You've got to be able to do it in order to really get the intricacies of how to defend it. Cause mm -hmm. you're not going to feel those little fast twitchy, you know, how the hips move and, and the wizard works and the weight and how to, you know, so you, you've got to embrace all of it. And then you kind of take that. And then I say, I know how to do this. Anything that I do is going to put me because I don't have to arrest anybody. Right. I don't, right. you're right. You attack me. It's fucking on. Right. So I don't have to worry about that, but I'm going to make sure that, uh, right. If, if we hit the ground, I'm getting back up to my feet because you know, I, I, everything that I try to create now, I work with off the spear system. So I tell everybody, if you don't know, if you do not train the spear system, if you don't, embrace that it doesn't matter what we do right now mm. everything we do right now That's if you so don't cool, man. if you don't do that it doesn't matter because you're dead <laughs> because <laughs> you you've already made a mistake so everything that i do after that i try to follow the principles of, of assault like they, you know uh, that uh you know and even though like we're talking about you do lose the initiative for the with, with the spear the spear still follows those principles of assault um, because I've surprised some fucking people by jamming them <laughs> with right. a spear. So even though, even though they have the. Uh, so so let, let me, let me, let me clarify some new stuff that, that might help you with this. When we do, when we do our training and it's been a while, we got to get together and train again. We, we when, when we do uh, the training now, we make a distinct, separation between d2 and d3 where you're trying to morally ethically legally defuse something at that moment there um the bad guy in action reaction action reaction the yeah. bad guy can make a move on you because you're trying to do the right thing whether you're talking to a cop or you're talking to a citizen going hey i don't want any trouble come on what's going on here in that moment that's where the spear is truly like the organic airbag and so I, I use this, I don't know if you've heard me talk about this before, but let's say I've got you in a car, uh, Hickson in a car, uh, the founder of Krav Maga, uh, Roger uh, 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 Mayweather in a car, yeah, like all the best combat athletes are all in a car and we're, gonna, we're going to race and we're in a remote deserted area and we're all lined up and our windows are down and we're revving our engines, we're all, and in this metaphor, our cars are our physicality. Our driving is our, our skill set, our, our strategy, and how we're going to move. And in that moment, we're getting ready to go. 
I see you, I look at you, I go, Marcus, you're going down. And you go, no, I'm using the spear. No, I'm using the spear. And <laughs> the jujitsu guy's going, fuck spear. And Krav's going, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to fucking block and punch you in the face. And, and, you know, <laughs> like, and everyone's got their own unconscious right. bias. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. And while we're waiting to go, and there's, you know, some girl with a flag getting ready to do this and jump, right? Like to start to start this drag race. We hear this horn honk and an 18 wheeler comes over this intersection in this remote area. He's honking because his brakes are out. And all we have time to do is look up and go, fuck. And he's like barreling along at uh, 80 miles an hour. And we, all of a sudden we realize we're all getting fucking hit. He's coming right through us. What does everybody do in the car at the same time? Everybody goes, fuck. Everyone brings their hands up yeah. to protect their head. Nobody shifts into reverse. Nobody shifts into drive. No, in the moment, and so in this crazy metaphor, what happens is physiology overrides cognition. Physiology, and that's this we were talking about, like the speed of survival supersedes the speed of theoretical decision making what right. would you do if the guy does this he shoots here he does that oh, i'll do this all. all of the answers are theoretical you can get right. into the flow state in a fight and have those magic moments but in the street what's different and you've heard me lecture about this in the street nobody agrees to be in an ambush and it's the ambush right. the sudden violent encounter that changes that attacks the neuroscience of training this is what everybody this is my my goal as a researcher and a coach is to you're like a you're like a fucking unicorn dude you're a guy that that i i i couldn't last a minute with you in a boxing match if if we went toe to toe like that's my respect for you and where i i understand that 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 if i had to beat you in a fight i would have to surprise you and do it usually while you were sleeping after i tranquilized you <laughs> um right so I don't have any illusions of a what I would do to protect myself and my family in a real fight. I, I don't have illusions about that, but I but I have. I'm not an idiot when I go like professional gladiators who also study what I do are fucking dangerous. And when I say you're a unicorn, it's because you're like one of the only guys that has done all the shit and still said you still need to study fucking spear. And and I tell people in this example if we took every airbag out of a car tonight the the death rate in hospitals tomorrow would be astronomic airbags save lives and what i want every combat genius every ninja every martial wizard listening to this to understand is that the start of flinch is the equivalent of an organic airbag and the airbag deploys when your driving skill doesn't count anymore so wow. however good you are at jujitsu or boxing or MMA or Krav or whatever, the air, the start of flinch happens because your survival system said, fuck, you either fucked up or you got surprised. And it doesn't matter if you're a beginner or expert, you still do it. So I wanted to clarify two things that are apology for the rant. I get a little worked up. But one is when we're training now, Marcus, we do specific drill reps where we go, um, this is the protective mechanism of the startle flinch. And because you said something, you said when you're using the spear, you, you, you partially lose the initiative. But there's another part of our training, which has evolved maybe since your exposure years ago, where we talk about protective versus preemptive. Right. And, and so protective here is, so I got, Bob, this is filled with a lot of water. It's pretty heavy. And that's simulating like a headbutt, right? So I'm here right. like this. I'm talking to the guy. My hands are too low. I'm going, man, you need to leave the bar. You're under arrest. I don't want any trouble. It doesn't matter who you are. And he moves on me and I go, oh, and I get hit back. But the airbag deployed. I'm back in the fight if I can catch up and I weather the ambush. Right. But then we do a ton of training and it's our emotional climate training drill, which I don't remember if you were exposed to, the ECT. Yep. Um, where, where you're cataloging the auditory, visual, and tactile pre-contact cues. And we've done some um, 
I don't know if you know David Weck. He's the genius that created the Bosu ball, and he's like he's a, yeah. he's a mad. I mad. spoke with him. He actually he actually uh, reached out to me and said he wanted to do a. Uh, we sat on the phone and talked forever. He actually did the core fist also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so, so David's a friend of mine, and just like a month ago, I'm down at his place. He's down in San Diego, and I'm talking about how auditory stimuli is faster than visual. Mm -hmm. and uh i said you need a machine to measure it and he says well that, that's obvious the reason why is because the sound waves hit you he's such a genius like i'd never thought about that that a sound wave hits you first because we always ask people where's the first place you're hitting a fight and some people go in the face i go no smart ass like <laughs> like the first place is is i got a bad feeling about this like every victim of violence who lived to tell the tale said the bad feeling but back to this is by by cataloging and doing drills where you're analyzing the auditory, visual, and, and tactile pre-contact cues, you can use the spear in the same way that you, you would use your jab or round kick. You go here, kind of boom, and you'd move. So the protective practice is having this happen. The preemptive is now when the guy goes to headbutt you and you've studied it, and he goes back, you're on the guy, and you're still moving with the speed of startle flinch right and, and it's very very subtle uh but it's an area where most people who look at the spear they don't go deep enough and they and so they ask the question is like why the fuck would you want to flinch and i've been asked that by like experts why are you teaching people to flinch i'm not teaching anyone to flinch i'm teaching them to convert the flinch and get back in the fight right right yeah so yeah, exactly it's 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 crazy anyways Hijack the, hijack the call. Yeah, why, and, and when people say that, you know, I, I go back to what I learned from you too, is that's that, you know, so people will say, well, if somebody throws a punch at me, why would I want to flinch? And I'll say, uh, have you ever seen uh, somebody with knife wounds on their hands? Right? Right. So uh, because them swinging that knife, their flinch was fast enough to put that hand up there, a gunshot or whatever, what's faster than the speeding bullet, the flinch. Right. So, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, there's lots of corner reports out there to back that up. Um, yeah, crazy. But the point that we're going with the jujitsu thing was that, uh, you know, I'm not going to use, right, I'm, I'm using that to keep myself up and mobile, not so I don't get to the ground. Right. That's the whole reason why I, I embraced it at the beginning was I want to know how to shut that shit down. You can't shut that shit down if you can't understand the uh concepts behind it and right. then w when i did this i immediately uh from obviously listening to you uh uh when i was training jujitsu uh and the, you know all the grappling arts so uh, i i was like uh you know they when they were teaching me well when you get side mounted this is how you you should have your side mount like if you're on bottom this is how you should be and i'm like they're getting me comfortable with just being side mounted, like, right? Like the thought process, somebody's passing my guard. And as soon as they get to a point that looks like they're about to, they're uh, going to effectively get there, you know, I'm going, okay, get the head, put the hand on the, uh, uh, on the belt line, get there, control the hips. I'm a willing participant in being side mounted now. Right. Just like you said, like, and I always say to people when, when, when they, somebody talks about, uh, you know, rape prevention and the guy comes over and grabs the wrist, I'm always like, at what point in your head did you, did your brain just say that somebody you didn't know was okay for them to get close enough and grab your wrist right, or grab your shirt? And, I mean, how do we get, why, why did this even happen? That, that's a problem. That shouldn't even happen. 100%. So. Yeah, with all of that, that's that's how in, you talk about how, you know, people, when you train, there's a lot of bad shit that happens. I, I go to the gym that I'm comfortable at. I walk in, I bring, and I go, hey, you got your mouthpiece, I got mine. You got your cup on, I got my cup on. We got our gloves, right? And they're, they're right. We, we already go there knowing that we're not going to murder anybody. And we even go, uh, we're excited to get in there and spar. But we know we're not going to, you know, that we're not going to get hurt. There may be a new guy in there. Then you get a little nervous because the guy's throwing some bombs, right? All these things. 
but it ain't lot, nothing like a fight. Like people don't it, I, have a really hard time. Like George Gurgel uh, is a great, because we're both, obviously you and I are both very good friends with George. Many years ago, George told me we were uh, uh, at his gym and he said to me, uh, uh, I'm going to do my best George uh, accent. Um, okay. He goes, <laughs> Uh, he's like, uh, you know, sometime I, uh, you know, I, I want to, I, I actually sound more like George St. Pierre, I think. He goes, <laughs> I, I, he goes uh, I want to have, uh, you know, I want to get in a street fight. And I'm like, what? And he's like, I want to get in street fight. And I'm like, you've never been in a street fight. And he's like, no, he goes, I'm from Fortaleza. He's like, I have maids and butlers. And, <laughs> you know, so I'm like, okay. I was like, so what would you do in a street fight? And he said, uh, what do you mean what I do? And I go, what would you do? And he goes, I do jujitsu. And I said, okay, let's kind of see it right now, what you would do if you and I got into a street fight. And he kind of looked at me funny. And, you know, we only, like, it wasn't even five or ten seconds. And then he just said to me, I, I know, I never want to get in street <laughs> right? fight. Right? So the mindset is completely different because you, again, uh, everything that you envision, you know, right? You see yourself as Bruce Lee. You see yourself as uh, 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 Jean-Claude Van Damme or whatever, doing these kicks and all this shit. You don't see, uh, your, your brain protects you from the real horrors that are going to happen. That's why, uh, you know, most people do not take some sort of, or most people aren't going to go to you or me or anybody else that teaches some kind of self-defense because their brain is protecting them because they don't mm -hmm. want to think about being raped. They don't want to be, think about being sure. killed or murdered. Your brain is protecting you. So, uh, you know, it, it, so in their head, they do something that gives them temporary, uh, feeling they go buy a gun and then they leave it in their, in their dresser and they never train with it or whatever, but the mace and, you know, and so now that gives them a false sense of security and they believe that they're safe, um, which is, you know, uh, which is a lie, you know, right. and, or taking just any martial art like uh, that's, you know, and like you said, you're, you're training yourself in those times to try to get into some kind of martial art karate stance or something. You're trying to create space um, and and. You know, it it's doesn't happen that way because it, when it happens, um, you know, like I'm saying, you, you got to kind of stick to some some basics that, that you know, like I was saying, the spear has is right. You have the ability of uh, surprise. You got speed. You have mobility, the penetrations of, uh, of the defenses and then finally violence of action. So if you can follow anything that you're creating, if it doesn't have those components, it's garbage. So if I'm doing something and it doesn't, if it doesn't get me closer to potentially ending the fight or at least getting them into a position where I can get them into what we call the end fight node, which means I'm giving up now uh, control of the fight. And I'll explain that uh, afterwards if you want, but um, then it doesn't work. Like if you do something and it leaves a little blotch on somebody, uh, it was a wasted technique. Um, so it needs to do something. It needs to stop them somehow uh, of their action and then allow you to progress through, you know, like your bridge of what you know after the spear, what you're capable of doing. And, uh, it, but if you don't, if you don't have something like that, you've got to look at, uh, you know, uh, other alternatives uh, because uh, you're, Again, you're wasting your time and you're wasting your money on uh, a, a lot of it. And just to be just just to add this here as a disclaimer on behalf of Marcus, he's he's purely talking about like like this chapter in his life. He works with cops and he works with with uh, individuals who truly are training for self defense, and 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 so he's very obviously you can tell uh, passionate about that if you want to um uh you know he's been a martial artist his whole life so he's got no problem with you studying martial arts it's when you also go and you go well i could use my wushu and my tai chi in this multiple assailant attack and not get dragged to a secondary crime scene Right. You know, he's going, well, to stop, like we're, we're, somebody sold you a bill of goods there. And he said, and, and, and again, it's, it's one thing 
for me to say that I, I would think that that maybe my longevity uh, over four decades uh, training real real fighters um, gets me a pass on this because I didn't have the background you had. I've been in you know uh, uh, a number of altercations and stuff like that, but nothing crazy that that you had. And that's always in the back of my head, like like almost like the George Gershell story. You know, when someone would go like the old roadhouse, oh, I thought you'd be taller. You're Tony Blower. I thought you'd be taller. Or, you know, oh, what's this guy know? He's never been people. You know what people started doing? <laughs> Calling me old man, like on posts. I'm like, <laughs> fuck, wow. I never, you know, I am, I am turning 61 in May. Holy shit, dude. Is that insane? But, but, but all, all of that to say, everyone listening to this is like, you know, Marcus has, he's like not some vegetarian saying you got to go vegan, you know, and all, and, and he's like, looks like he's 110 pounds and deathly ill. And, and you're going, Oh, why would I listen to you? Like, here's a guy that's done everything and saying you like for pure self-defense, you need to look at the scenario. You need to be able to uh, uh, protect yourself in the ambush. And then, in his, in his own way, what I've been saying for years, spears a bridge to your next move, meaning the airbag deploys, you push away the danger. And what he was, was, was alluding to after that is if you don't, if you don't have a way to escape or, or subdue the person after that, keeping in mind that force must parallel danger, you can't do whatever you want in a fight, um, then, um, then you need to train. Um, Marcus, let me ask you a question. Can you still hear me? Or we got an audio issue. We good? I got you back there now. Okay. No. Um, I don't know. Let me let me ask you this only because it's eleven thirty. Um, yeah. What What are you doing these days? Is for like if someone wants to train with you, how do they learn yeah. more about you? How do they get in touch with you? Because we, we'll let, we could talk for out for hours and hours, but it's already yeah. Good. So you're right. So um, right now. Uh, the only the only way that I'm I'm really training because of this whole uh, COVID Locked thing. The shit, yeah. Right. So uh, I'm the I teach Greg Jackson's mixed martial arts program as my regular job at nights, and then during the day I'm a I'm a biomechanist, so uh, biomechanic specialist. So what I do is I work with people who um, who have you know I got some people who have spinal fusions. I've got uh, some people that have had cancer and stuff like that. So, uh, or people who, uh, you know, used to play a sport or something when they were younger and then years have gone by and they've kind of fallen apart. So, uh, but that's my day job. And then my night job is teaching, uh, you know, Greg Jackson's martial arts program for tap out. So, um, right now I haven't been doing, um, the last, I did the scat training for, uh, Clayton PD, um, a little over a year ago, right before all this COVID thing happened. Um, so I've kind of taken a side step on, on doing the right. law enforcement training for right now, but. But you'll, if, as things open up, you'll, you'll, you'll resume yeah. some of that stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. So the best thing to do is follow you on Facebook, Instagram. You have a newsletter and shit like that. Yeah. You yeah just uh, uh, Instagram. It's just Marcus Paul Davis. And then it's the I believe, same on Facebook. Uh, I have a Twitter, but I, I don't use Twitter yeah. at all. I'll, I'll uh, put I'll put your links in the show notes. Yeah, but dude, any uh, any uh, um, anything I didn't ask you that you wish I did that you wanted to talk about real quick? No, not really. I mean, just that um, my 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 whole point with with all of this that I try to get people to understand that. Uh, you know, as much as they they may believe that they have some special talent or special move or whatever it is, their martial art, um, they they they're not understanding sometimes the whole premise behind this, and that is, uh, right? If if somebody you know ambushes you, if somebody 
uh, has initiative and that's already lost to you, if somebody's deciding when, where, and how the fight's going to take place, if that's what they've got, then your, your martial art is no good because it's not going to automatically respond. You know, like uh, when, you know, when I see a bee, I don't put my hands up and, and start uh, boxing with a bee. Uh, when I see a bee, I swat at it like this. And then I say, oh, that's a butterfly because mm -hmm. I, my brain didn't thread discriminate and let me know it was a butterfly. Right. Well, that's basically what happens when you, right? You, when you, somebody jumps on you, you don't go into some kind of karate stance. You immediately go, what the fuck? And you're like, you know, then all kinds of shit can happen. I don't know. People, some people immediately have told me when they've been attacked, they've gone immediately into denial. Like, this, right. why me? This isn't happening. There's like all kinds of physiology and, and mental shit that's going on. I mean, you've got, you know, uh, dopamine and epinephrine and norepinephrine and adrenaline and all this chemicals and stuff freaking out. And, uh, you know, you just, so my point is, uh, you got to have some place or something to be able to uh, move into your fighting style or whatever it is going to be. And this is the one and only missing link that you're going to have. And like you say, every, Hey, you're, everybody's already a black belt in the flinch. Right. Um, it, you're right. You're going to do it no matter what, right. Mike Tyson's going to flinch. Right. And then, then he's, then he's going to kill you. Right. <laughs> he's going to flinch first. Right. So uh, you're right. And uh, it, man. toughest guys, you know, big, lots of big, tough guys have been shot, stabbed and killed at close range because, you know, they weren't, you know, they, they were trying to get into their style or whatever, and it just didn't happen. Dig it, man. Dude, thank you so much. It was good catching up, and uh, we'll have to do this again. Um, I'll put the show notes in the show notes. I'll put links to your, your social media profiles, and uh, we got to get you to an updated course and, uh, and, and get you to see some of the new shit we're doing. It's pretty exciting. Yeah. No, I would absolutely love to. I still have your cds i even got uh, even in my car I, you wouldn't believe it but i listen to all that stuff all the time so wow i do Dude. all the time man. thank you you're a fucking unicorn that that much <laughs> with with your background that you that you respect what i do so much it means a lot to me i do man 100 percent. okay marcus davis thank you buddy you got it buddy stand by all right, man Love you. be safe <laughs>